Okay, um, hello to everyone. My name is Alex Plishkov, and I'm the director of the Politaev Institute for Theoretical and Historical Studies in the Humanities, and the head of our project on classical text and classical authors in ethical theory here in National Research University Higher School of Economics. Uh, today, we start our project series of discussions on philosophical ethics um, and so conversation in classical uh, ethics. And I believe we have uh, the best possible interlocutor for our uh, starting initiative. Uh, our guest today is uh, Ras uh, Schaefer Landau, uh, philosopher of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, the president of the Central Division of the American Philosophical Association. Uh, Professor Schaefer Landau is the world's leading specialist in the field of metaethics and he is the editor of the influential Oxford Studies in Metaethics. Among other things, Professor Schaefer Landau had a significant impact on the teaching of ethics in universities around the world. Uh, his anthologies, Ethical Theory uh, and the Ethical Life, uh, Fundamental Readings in anti Ethical and Moral Problems, have been uh, repeatedly reprinted and used all over the world. Uh, this area of uh, his work uh, has become, become one of the key reference points for our own project. Uh, Professor Schaefer, Schaefer Landau, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for that very kind introduction. <laughs> yeah, so we have three question pools uh, and uh, we'd, we'd like to discuss with you today roughly first on, on the questions of the various status of uh, classical work in ethics, uh, second on classical works and contemporary world, and finally on the role of the ethics as discipline in the university. After that, we'll have a short and quick round of questions. Um, and if you are ready, I'm glad to give floor to Anna Vernikovska. Thank you. So um, the philosophical canon has been disputed and seriously challenged over the past years, which prompted the addition of some new figures to the established list, such as, for example, women philosophers. From your own viewpoint, what works do we call classical and who do we call the classics? That's, <laughs> Anna, your question is a terrific question. Uh, like many of the questions that you'd sent me for my consideration, I. I imagine that you don't want me to just enumerate all the classics, but rather to give a general criterion or criteria by which we can judge a piece to be a classic work. Um, I can give, I don't have a definition of a classic, so, but I, I can give a sufficient condition at least, and that is that the work is sufficiently uh, original and deep so as to earn the attention of readers across generations. And the, the uh, books that are, the works that are judged, at least in the Western canon, which is the one I'm familiar with, uh, to be classics seem to me to have earned that status. Now, then there's a question of whether there are missing classics, that is ones that aren't recognized as classics but should be recognized because they are also novel and uh, very deep, uh, making original points and making them in a way that uh, reveals a kind of uh, comprehension of view, a, a kind of systematicity and a depth of view, uh, but that were not recognized because they were written uh, typically because they were written by either uh, figures who were unpopular in their day or because they were written by figures who were members of oppressed classes who were not thought to be fit or apt uh, authors for such works. I'm, I'm uh, betting that there are these neglected classics out there. But myself, I should confess, I'm not an historical scholar. Uh, I don't, you know, I know many of these classic texts, but my work is primarily not focused on trying to 
make it scholarly advancements in historical texts, but rather to, well, as Alex said, trying to push the boundaries of contemporary meta-ethics just a little farther. So I don't, I don't unfortunately have the identity, <laughs> the titles of these missing classics here to present to you. But um, if I were a betting man, I would say there are some such classics awaiting our discovery. And uh, there are now scholars who are intent on looking back through history to discover these. Please, I don't know if I'm giving you answers that are adequate or inadequate at any point. So if you want to follow up, I, from my perspective, at least, it's totally fine to do so. Um, maybe I'll ask um, how the field of ethics in particular um, underwent these changes. So in your opinion, what were the ma major changes uh, for ethical fields uh, during all this discussion of the canon? Uh, does what were the major changes over the, say the past 20 years during that discussion? Is that what you're well, wondering? Approximately, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, so there's, there hasn't been very much change <laughs> in the canon. Now, there has been much greater attention, uh, explicit and implicit, uh, paid to the importance of attending to upper underrepresented voices. So there's there's much more work going uh, going into, as I say, the the search for authors who have been neglected historically, but also from uh, with regard to attention to contemporary work, there is much more importance. Uh, given nowadays to making sure that the voices of women, for instance, and other uh, underrepresented minorities uh, are, are heard in philosophy. And I think that's a very healthy trend. Uh, the book that uh, you all seem to be working, the book of mine that you seem to be working with, this ethical theory book, that was published nine years ago, which means it was put together 10 and 11 years ago. Uh, so it's, uh, it would be, it would look a little differently uh, were I to be putting together a new edition now. I'm, I'm not, but we could, one of the questions I know uh, will, I've anticipated, so we can talk about, we'll have a chance to talk about that a little, a little later in our conversation, I think. Yeah, and I suppose it will be not later, but right now. <laughs> as oh, for it's your right. Book, it's the next one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, as for your book, um, Ethical Theory, that you mentioned, which we take as a standard that guides us in our work, were there any explicit theoretical factors that led to changes in the, in the selection of texts for its subsequent editions? Well, this is, I've only published two editions, and this edition that this edition that is the latest edition is now a decade old, basically. There weren't any, uh, no, there weren't, perhaps disappointingly, between the publication of the first edition and the second edition, I think it was only four or five years, there were not any large theoretical changes that I was trying to accommodate in, uh, in updating the table of contents, except for one, which was significant, which is that in the first edition, there was no section on feminist ethics, and in the second, there was. So just in, in that amount of time, so like between, uh, I, I actually <laughs> embarrassingly perhaps don't remember when the first edition of this book was published, but say between 2005 or six and 2011 and 12, it became, clear to me, it was probably clear to other people, but we all have things to learn, right? It became clear to me during that time that um, it was very important to uh, make sure that some of the most, uh, most wonderful contributions in feminist ethics were represented in this book. And were I to you know, put together a book like this now, 
I did I did so before, and I would do and in any event, to the extent that I was looking to try to uh, uh, convey convey uh, ideas and trends primarily for a U.S. market, I would include another section uh, on the philosophy of race and. I, I have to think about this more. You know, maybe you could help me think about this. But I go back and forth because I as other textbooks as well. Between, on the one hand, wanting a section that basically deals with oppression and the voices of uh, thinkers who uh, come from are members of oppressed groups and or represent ideas that have not been represented in, in uh, major philosophical uh, trends uh, beforehand because they are precisely because they're members of underrepresented groups. And one way to gather these diverse voices, admittedly diverse non-uniform voices is under the rubric of uh, thinking about oppression generally. That said, uh, the reason I've resisted that is because not everyone who, not every woman philosopher, for instance, is writing about oppression. Of course, just like men, you know, men and male philosophers, they write about everything. <laughs> uh, just because, you know, philosophers are people. People are curious. They, they, you know, they're very broad in their interests. In the same way, you know, in the U.S. context with philosophers who are African-American or who are Latinx, they write about everything. They don't just write about oppression. So, while oppression itself is a very important, uh, a very important set of topics for consideration, I've been reluctant to try to gather together all all philosophers, you know, not all philosophers, but representative philosophers from underrepresented groups, and just lump them together like that. That just doesn't seem appropriate to me. That said, when it comes to feminist ethics, there is, I think. There's already uh, through work over roughly 50 years. I mean, I know th there, are, there are classic feminist authors like Wollstonecraft and de Beauvoir who go uh, earlier than that. But uh, through that sort of work, there have already been, uh, uh, there's a canon already. And that canon is being pushed forward in various ways, as, as we do in philosophy. Uh, so I think it, it's very appropriate to have a, a section on feminist philosophy in there. And I'd have to think more about how to become more representative uh, were I to put together another, uh, another edition. That's probably the main kind of theoretical shift. It's not, it's not a thought that what's here in the book is in some way mistaken it's and that the categories there are problematic. It's rather that we need to, I need to, and others uh, need to broaden our horizons yet farther in terms of being encompassing about what excellent philosophy can look like. Thank you. And, um... Can you say that um, any influence can, can be attributed to um, some shifts in students' interest or um, maybe uh, some other discussions? Uh, I mean, um, maybe among uh, scholars, um, maybe not so formal. Uh, had these factors any influence as well on the selection? Uh, to be honest, the input from students did not have very much, uh, did not play much of a role. Uh, I myself did not, uh, I didn't poll or canvas students uh, when, when using my own book, which isn't that frequent. I didn't, I didn't use my own 
book very much. Uh, it's also the case that when I used it, I and when I when I continued to use it, which isn't very much, I use it with undergraduates who don't have much philosophical background, and so the so they read this, they say, oh, you know, these authors are great, or or in some cases, I hate this what I just read, <laughs> but they're not in they're not really they don't have the breadth of uh, familiarity with these texts to be able to. Uh, suggests new new things, basically. If I were teaching it at a graduate level, then that would be a different matter. But it turns, as, just as a matter of fact, I don't teach this book at the graduate level. I, I do more focused uh, seminars for my graduate students. I uh, The publisher, however, did solicit reviews from at least a dozen other philosophers who, them, who uh, teach ethics at their respective colleges or universities. And so I took that input very seriously. Between that kind of input and just my ability to discern trends in the field from what was being published, uh, you know, I, I check all the journals and, and take a look at the major publishers and, uh, and what they are, what they're, the books they're publishing. So, that's my my the way I and talk to people, of course. So through all those sources, I felt that I had, you know, I felt, for instance, the imperative to include a section on feminist ethics there. Uh, and you know, that's basically the way I, I came to decide on the changes that were necessary. I did, of course, have to get rid of some pieces from the first edition, but that's just a function of the publishing world. They won't let you publish a 5,000 page book. <laughs> it can't be any longer than the first edition. That's, that's the mandate. So when I add something, I have to get rid of something too. Thank you. And speaking of the publishing wor world and um, a hypothetical situation where you uh, had no publishing limits. Um, and you mentioned in the preface to ethical theory that the range of text would be even broader. So what section would you broaden in this in that case, or maybe um, what, uh, or maybe you would broaden all of them. So how would uh, this hypothetical situation uh, look I would definitely broaden all of them <laughs> because there, you know, each section, uh, I don't know, has six, seven, eight pieces at most. Maybe none of them have eight pieces. I don't know. But just think about, you, you know, any of those sections. And you can, I'm sure you can yourself think about think of more, many more than five or six pieces that you that you think deserve a place there. So uh, these sections would be much, much broader. In, so there would be many more proponents of the view of various views. There would be more diversity of viewpoint within each section. Um, I would be able to offer uh, more than one representation of a given viewpoint, there would be complementary, multiple defenses of, say, act utilitarianism or rule utilitarianism, for instance, just to take an example. But it's also the case that uh, because of publishing limits, I was not able to include, I've made the decision, given space limitations, to include only proponents of views rather than criticisms of views. And you, you know, we're, we're all philosophers here. We know how philosophy works. We make progress by, by sending something out, uh, sending a view out, and then awaiting you know, smart people telling us why we've made mistakes in various ways, and then sharpening our view and respond, you know, responding, sharpening our thinking about things. So the role of criticism plays a, um, an important role in, in philosophy. And uh, critical pieces are entirely absent in this book. So I would definitely include uh, that because in some cases, there are critical pieces that themselves are classics. Uh, and um, as classics, they, they deserve a place here.
here in, in the book, but like, the book, although it's quite large, no one I think would want to be walking around with a book like, you know, like that big. Um, if it were a PDF, you could search it pretty easily. <laughs> Back when I published this in 2011 or 12, that we didn't have eBooks. Now we've got eBooks. Uh, you know, if, if the publisher said, Russ, just go for it, uh, then I'd go for it. But the publisher hasn't hasn't said that and and likely won't because just this is a little bit of un, probably uninteresting information every piece that you include in the book you have to pay for uh you know in, unless it's an old piece that's in the public domain so the publisher doesn't want to have an unlimited book like that so anyway those are if i had if i had uh unlimited time and, and uh, space rather those are some of the changes i'd make Thank you very much. And now I'm, now I'm delighted to give the floor to Nadezhda Lebedeva. Thank you. Hello, uh, Professor Sheffel and Dow. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, so my series of questions will deal with ethics and the modern world. Um, that's the title. I wanted uh, to begin with, I wanted to share a fact of uh, the Russian language, of the common language, which I think very frequently exhibits curious intuitions. In 2018, there emerged an umbrella term, uh, new ethics, which is used uh, to indicate very different phenomena of uh, our modern life, including uh, harassment, cancel culture, feminism, language reforms, for example, using they instead of he. Uh, affirmative action, and now the movement like Black Lives Matter, and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, very often this term is used pejoratively. Um, so very often people are quite hostile to these changes because they feel that it's a kind of a threat to the traditional ethics or the, to the traditional way of life, um, maybe to the traditional morality. And I wanted to ask your opinion, as you belong to a different culture, how do you see it? Um, do you think there is anything to this intuition that this ethics is new? Or uh, do you believe, uh, and yeah, and maybe the second question, do you think it's a valid term? So uh, yeah, the question is, do you think there is any, anything new to all these phenomena? And do you think they could be uh, embraced under an umbrella term? Is there any valid reason um, for connecting them after, under one name? Hmm. Well, I want to start, my, my answer is going to involve a good deal of conjecture, and I want to begin by uh, admitting my ignorance about, I don't know Russian, and nor am I acquaint, well acquainted with the cultural phenomena of the, the pushing back against uh, um, Concerns about uh, harassment, for instance, uh, linguistic innovations uh, and things like that. I'm basically taking your word for what's happening and I'm perfectly willing to do that, but because I'm not myself well acquainted with this phenomenon, I don't feel confident about any answer I'd, I'd be giving you. Um, the, the, the phenomena you've pointed to are a diverse phenomena, but here's what they seem to me to have in common, and that is a recognition that there have been portions of society that have uh, been treated, that have in fact been treated as second-class citizens. Uh, as having viewpoints or interests that are not as fully deserving of consideration as those uh, of others. So let's just, I'll, I'll suggest something and you tell me if I'm mistaken about it, okay? So with regard to the linguistic innovation and your talk of harassment, for instance, that brings immediately to mind this thought that of, um, um, that the harassment in question is sexual harassment. And the linguistic innovation is rather than treating uh, the third person singular, the default third person singular plur, uh, pronoun as masculine, we instead, in order to try to uh, re reveal our recognition and reinforce in readers' minds the idea that any anonymous 
individual might just as well be a woman as a man or not gender binary, we adopt the use of the plural third person to, to designate a single person. Am I on the right track as, as far as the innovations you're talking about? Yeah, okay. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, so g given that understanding, um, the, I guess there are two questions. One is the legitimacy of these kinds of innovations, and the other is whether or not there it's appropriate to use, a, to denote this constellation of phenomena by means of a single term. With regard to the latter, I really want to defer to you all <laughs> and not pronounce as someone who's unfamiliar with the culture and saying that, yeah, it's all, it's all really different parts of one phenomenon. I, I, just, I honestly don't know because I don't know, I'm not well enough acquainted with the phenomena that that this term is actually being used to designate, especially as the phenomena is embodied in your culture, not mine. So I'm generally, I don't want to be this kind of, oh, here's this guy, this American, he's telling the Russians, you know, how to do things. That's, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the possibility of legitimate cross-cultural critique. But I think that when you engage in that, you need to be very sensitive and informed about the culture that you are criticizing. So I think it's perfectly fine to criticize US culture along a variety of dimensions. I've done it myself, but I also think it's fine for a Russian to do it, you know, or, or someone from Uruguay or some, you know, or someone from Sri Lanka, as long as they're well acquainted with the phenomena that they are that they are criticizing or perhaps praising. In this case, what we're talking about though are phenomena that at least as I understand it are, um, are responses to morally problematic practices, customs and conventions. Um, so to the extent that what, what we have here is a very familiar phenomenon with I'm, I'm sure distinctively Russian elements to it, but the familiar phenomenon of a uh, of a situation in which a culture has for a very long time elevated the interests of one group or a set of groups at the expense of the interests of others. And those others are pushing back for greater recognition. And some in the majority group recognize the, the history of injustices and the structural injustices that are exemplified within traditional society. And some members of the majority are becoming allies with those who, with some members of previously disenfranchised or discriminated against or oppressed groups and seeking for broader recognition and possibly enfranchisement, but at least broader recognition of an equal moral status to the extent that that's what's going on, I applaud that. Um, whether or not, because that's that's to me a move that's um, that's a move for moral progress, as I see it. Now, of course, those who are pushing back against the so-called new ethics don't see it as moral progress, but this too is a familiar phenomenon. Right, the people whose interests are being uh, especially protect, well protected by the status quo, are typically reluctant <laughs> to give up their exalted status and make room, make make uh, make room for those whose interests have typically not been counted uh, for as much. I say all this at a fairly abstract level because I don't want to commit myself to any specific claims about Russian culture and Russian history, because once again, I want to admit my ignorance there. But to the extent that I've, I'm describing things in a way that matches your take on what's happening there, I would, I would just make note of this very common phenomenon and think that, um, and, but while saying, I'm not sure whether one term is, 
is appropriate to capture all of them because I'm not familiar enough with, with the facts on the ground in Russia to know whether that's so. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, yeah, I put down um, how you worded it, uh, the resistance to morally objectionable practices, and I believe that this could be a good uh, like determinant or a good description of what uh, people try to denote or try to indicate to say new ethics. And mm -hmm. uh, my next question would be, because I'm a big believer in uh, classical ethical thoughts and um, the uh, philosophical thought as such. So do you think that this body of works that we have, that we have inherited can mm -hmm. help us talk to those who push back against these changes. So do you think we could find a common ground or the language to discuss these topics in the classical ethics? <laughs> That's such a great, hard question. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm to... sorry. <laughs> no, no. No, that's what we're here for, right? You know, you're not here to just ask me super easy questions. You could, you know, we could all answer the easy questions. It's the hard questions that we have to <laughs> struggle through, but we could do that together. I, what, I guess I'd have two sorts of answers to you, uh, depending on how you intended your question. On the one hand, you might be asking, are there resources within classical texts for providing sound arguments on behalf of the so-called new ethics? And the answer to that, if that's your question, my answer is yes, there are those resources. If, you're, if your question is instead, can we rely on these texts uh, in order to actually have a, uh, actually change the minds of those, let's call them traditionalists, uh, so that they become more uh, congenial, more open to thinking about things in what I will call a more progressive way. Then I'm very skeptical <laughs> about that. Now, your cul Russian culture may be, I, I speak of Russian culture as if it's just one uniform thing. I realize no culture is completely homogenous. I, I understand that. But the, the, sort of, um, uh, the sort of cultural values that are represented by those who use the term new ethics in a pejorative way, those who would pre prefer to see perhaps men remain uh, largely the ones who are in political and economic power, uh, those who don't want to acknowledge the equal moral importance of the interests of various ethnic minorities with regard, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, Russian, uh, ethnic Russian uh, majority interests. These sorts of people, um, in my experience, it, United States, the people who have similar sorts of views are not people who are inclined to think philosophically in the first place. And it's all, and this is actually an especially acute problem in the US, and that is that most people are not inclined to think philosophically. <laughs> this is a very anti-intellectual culture in the US, to speak very broadly, of course, um, where the, you know, if you were to just to try to uh, appeal so philosophically to philosophical considerations and making an argument that would only in very small circles make much progress, but with a larger population that wouldn't really work here. I don't know if it's the same in Russia or, or not, but in any event, if, if the question is practically speaking, can we rely on the texts of Kant or Mill, for instance, in order to try to make concrete political progress uh, in the United States? You certainly couldn't. <laughs> and like I said, the, the people who, who, uh, who are inclined to these more traditional perspectives, although they in, in my experience, have rationalizations for preserving the status quo, they are very, very rarely able to give a, 
uh, you know, a sophisticated, well-reasoned justification for maintaining an inegalitarian set of social structures. So is that, is that enough by way of answer? Do you want to follow up in some, in some way? Um, maybe I will follow up uh, with one final question, if that's OK with you. Uh, so since you said that the majority of the population does not tend to think philosophically, and I think it's true for any country in the world, why is it then important to read the classics? So what can this book give us um, in this modern world of uh, increasing polarization? Um, since it's not enough, it's not, it does not provide the sufficient ground uh, for reasoning, for example, with those who are opposed to changes. Yeah, uh, that's another great question. And what, and what I'd say is uh, there, are, there are various ways you can look at intellectual activity. One way is to look at it through the lens of uh, it's through what I'll call an instrumental lens or a pragmatic lens where philosophical activity is seen as just any other kind of activity, namely one whose value derives entirely from its ability to promote a certain end. Maybe the teleological conception is a better than instrumental conception, I don't know. You can pick your own fancy word, but the basic idea is very simple. You want to know why you should do something, what the justification for doing a particular activity is. The answer is always given by the value that is realized by undertaking that activity. Now, I think instrumental is better because, at least in English, that connotes this idea that um, when doing, say, philosophical activity, the, its, its value has to be in, some, in terms of something that it can get you. And uh, in the US at least, that value is usually money. <laughs> so you, wait, it doesn't have to be. It could be political change. So, but, but no matter what, you know, no matter whether it's money, political change, uh, some, you know, something else, there's another way to look at the activity of reading classic texts, and that is to say that they are valuable for their own, that activity is valuable in its own right. Um, I believe that myself, although I also recognize that it's very difficult to convince someone of the intrinsic value of something if they don't already see it. I mean, think about the intrinsic value of happiness. I think happiness is intrinsically valuable, but suppose you're talking to someone who frowns all day long and just doesn't see the value of happiness. It's not, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> I'm not sure what you could do to try to convince that person. Now, when it comes to, I, I wanna just return to this idea of the instrumental value of reading the classics. Whether uh, I believe that they are instrumental intrinsically valuable, but I also believe they're instrumentally valuable. They can give you goods. They can real, you can realize good things, that is, yield good things through your deeper and deeper understanding of classic texts. One thing you get is understanding of a set of very serious human issues. Like how should we treat other people? What's worth pursuing? in a life? Do, you know, are we morally responsible for our actions? These questions are vit literally, they're vital questions to ask. And by reading classics sensitively, we and thinking through them, engaging with them, grappling with them, we ourselves formulate more, more comprehensive, deeper views and gain greater understanding about these questions that are central to living a, living a good human life. That's something that's really valuable. If you ask specifically, how is reading the classics going to help inaugurate political change? The answer is it may well not do that. It might, you might, you might get someone like in, in our country 
we had Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who was very well acquainted with the political classics and he used that as well as other elements to uh, inspire him to undertake radical social reform. How often does that happen? Not very often at all. So, it, so I guess the takeaway is this, if you are trying to justify the reading of or engagement with the classic texts in moral philosophy by, by the amount of political change that that activity is going to bring about, that's not gonna be a successful justification, I think. But that's not, to me, uh, although it's a laudable goal, it's one that will be realized very, very, very rarely and if we're going to justify the activity of engaging with these texts, it's, it's gonna to have to be on other grounds. And, but I think there are those other grounds, the ones I articulated before. So I, I think we can give a good answer to that question, but we'd have to shift away from looking at political, re shifting, changing political reality as the basis of the justification for doing that. Well, wow, thank you very much. That was uh, insightful and that was very inspiring too. Thank you again. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. That's all for me and I'm happy to pass the mic over to Yekaterina Parshina. She has more questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nadezhda. Uh, hello, Professor. And uh, my questions deal with ethics and university, as you probably already know. Uh, so, in contemporary universities, the uh, so-called economic reason plays a dominant role if something is economically inefficient, it's ruled out. But um, the very, um, yeah, yes, the very university ethos seems to inherit some um, inefficient elements like knowledge, knowledge and research, demands, uh, they demand time, leisure and um, unpractical interest and so on. Uh, so, the question is, what role uh, does ethics play in the contemporary university as you see it? And what role do you think it should play? And uh, I understand that it is quite a vague question. So your answer can be as abstract as you want. <laughs> well, uh, ethics as a subject of study, rather than, you know, we in every institution, every institution should be run ethically, of course, but I'm taking your question to be what role should the study of ethics play in the university, and I think it should play. Um, it definitely has a role to play in the university. Why? Because what's the purpose of the university? The question I just asked actually was ill formed. <laughs> as soon as I said it, I realized I shouldn't have said it that way. What is the purpose of the university? That assumes that there's just a single purpose of the university. There isn't. There are multiple legitimate purposes of a university. A university is there, of course, to train people to think better. But that's not the that's not the only purpose of the university. It, you know, a university can also be there legitimately to train the next generation of teachers, engineers, doctors, uh, economists, historians. It's, it's there, it, a university has an economic role, you pointed to that. It has an economic role to play in the larger society. And it, as a state university, I'm not sure how, how the universities are run in, in Russia, whether there is, as it is in the US, whether there are, universities supported by the state, and then there are also private universities. I teach it and I have always taught at state universities. Um, and to the extent that a university is a state university, it has a special obligation to, uh, to graduate students who are going to make some contributions to the state. Um, now, there are limits to that, of course. So here, so I think, for instance, if a state is deeply morally corrupt 
and it looks at the university simply as a tool in order to uh, train the next generation of corrupt politicians to believe in corrupt ideals and to maintain a corrupt system. I'm not saying that's what's happening. Just to be clear, in Russia, I don't know nearly enough about what's happening there to make any claim. I'm just saying in the abstract, we know of state of states that do this, that have trained, that set up their universities with um, ideological tests to make sure that every faculty member is adhering to the specific state-sponsored ideology and is using the university basically as a way to reinforce an ideological status quo. When I say that it's part of a university, at least a state-sponsored university, to train the next generation of workers, basically across a diverse field, um, I think that's right. But I want to introduce this qualification that I think a university is being improperly manipulated when it's when it's got these sorts of ideological tests, and when it's it, and when it is um, seeking to train a generation of the the next generation of workers to ensure that these workers are ideologically pure and reinforce existing inequalities and injustices, okay? So that's the exception I want to make to what I think is otherwise a plausible point that when a state, when you have a state institution like a university, one of its legitimate goals is to make sure that you've got a well-trained next generation of workers who can contribute to the state. That's all by way of saying that there are multiple legitimate goals of the university, but one of them is certainly uh, the, the development of a critically engaged generation of citizens, whereby critically engaged, I mean citizens who are trained as a result of their university experience to think more critically about the the legitimacy as, as well as the efficiency of existing social institutions. Now, with regard to efficiency, I'm going to leave that to the economics and the business majors, but when it comes to legitimacy, that is the proper subject of ethics. There is no other, air, there is no other department or program in the university whose faculty members are more suit, are better suited to critically examine the legitimacy of existing social structures than those in an ethics program. Now, this is not to say, I just want to issue a caution. This is not to say that the purpose of an ethics course is, to, is for ethics faculty to tell students how to think about, sorry, I wanted to say this very clearly. The purpose is not to tell the students that they need to share the specific visions of what's morally right and wrong, good and bad, that are had by the faculty member. The goal of an ethics education at, at, at university is to get students to be able to think critically for themselves by giving them the tools that come in, in two sorts that enable them to engage in that sort of critical uh, investigation. One is the tools that philosophy gives, no matter the area you're talking about, whether it's metaphysics, philosophy of science, or ethics. And these are the tools of critical thinking, which philosophers, to my mind, I know this is going to sound prejudicial to those, anyone who's listening who's not a philosopher, but to my mind, philosophy gives people those critical tools better than any other discipline does. And then there's also the substance. So we could, we could think of this in terms of the form of thinking, which is given by acquaintance with logical, you know, with courses in logic and critical thinking. And then there is the matter of thinking, the subject matter. If you, if you are super logic, if you've got a great logical brain, that's not going to help you if you don't have the substance, the, the content 
to engage your brain with. So that's what ethics courses do. They, they, and they, they acquaint you with brilliant minds who have already thought as deeply as most of us are ever going to think about these essential questions of life. And when you combine these two things, as you do in a well-run ethics course, you combine the emphasis on critical thinking. Just because someone feels a certain way doesn't by itself ratify or certify the content of their feeling. We need to engage critically with that, no matter you know, which side politically you're on. We need to critically engage with that. And we need to do that by reference to ideas that have already in some way stood the test of time. Not, not to say that everything so in this book, this ethical theory book, which I've looked at now for the first time in five years in preparation for this conversation. Not, not to say that everything in that book is true. Of course it's not, right? Because there's so many conflicting views in there, but rather to say that the, I, the ideas within our texts, some contemporary, some classics, are ones that people who've had the good fortune to devote their professional lives to thinking about these incredibly interesting, deep, complex questions. Let's hear what they have to say about them. <laughs> why, why not? And once you do and, ma and marry that kind of acquaintance with the sort of critical thinking skills you acquire in philosophy, that, that is, that's awesome. That, that leads to someone who, compare someone who's had that experience and someone who's acquired some of those skills by exposure to an ethics course with someone who hasn't. The, the, the second sort of person is missing something in their life. They may not recognize it, of course, but they're missing something that's, that's essential to, to living a, fully, a full, flourishing life. I'm not saying that you need to be, a, I'm not a Plato here saying you need to be a philosopher in order to live a flourishing life, but there's something missing if you don't, you're not afforded the opportunity to develop your critical skills and focus them on questions of perennial human interest. And that's what ethics courses do. Thank you. And the next question is the next question is related to what you just talked about, what you just talked about. Um, it's, it's also a more specific, specific one, sorry. Uh, do you think there should be something like a required course of ethics uh, in, the core, in the core curriculum, I'm sorry, for all students, regardless of their specialization? Yes. <laughs> but yeah, of, course, I, I, of course, you know, given everything I've said, that answer is unsurprising. Also, given the fact that I'm a professor of ethics, it's unsurprising. You know, I could see someone who's not a philosopher watching this, if anybody does, and say, yeah, what, what did you think he was going to say? He's a professor of ethics. Of course, he thinks that everybody needs to take an ethics course. But I've just tried to give you, I probably spent too long doing that, but I've just tried to give you a justification for the importance of that kind of claim. And I'll tell you what, I... I don't say that ethics is the only course that should be required in the curriculum. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that ethics is more important than anything else you could possibly think of. But I am, but I am saying that given its, its absolute central, the questions in ethics, their absolute centrality in, in human life, and given this, the critical thinking skills that come with a well-taught philosophy course, I think that it's it's it just it would be a terrible shame to leave university, which itself is such a wonderful opportunity for people to have the opportunity of a university education, to leave that without without taking a, an ethics course. So yes, I do believe it ought to be an element in the required uh, curriculum. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thank you. Uh, and uh, another, like, uh, yeah, another dimension is the relationship of the university professors and students and administration. Uh, so, what do you think about universities' ethical codes or codes of conduct? Like, for example, in Russia, with the legacy of the Soviet past, uh, it's often it is often considered uh, by the professors. Uh, 
as an instrument of pressure. What, what sort? Could you explain what sort of pressure you're you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so for example, if uh, some professors or some students are required to, to have some ethical codes, for, for example, if they are admitted to the university, they need to uh, like follow up to that code. And for, for instance, they can't, uh, uh, they uh, need to be very careful with uh, what uh, they're talking about in social media, for example, if uh, mm. they can't uh, like, uh, like th there can be some problems if they say something about politics or something like that, for example. I see. Oh, oh okay. Um, I think I have a better sense of the question now. Um, my, own, my own view is that these sorts of code, I, I want to, I guess, be careful here. I think that professors need to be held to some minimal ethical standards uh, when when they when professors engage in sexual harassment, for instance, they ought to be punished for that uh, and because because sexual harassment is an ethical violation. So I think that's you know there's some ethical elements of an ethical code that seem to me to be perfectly appropriate. But it sounds like what you're imagining is a kind of political litmus test, which says that professors may not engage in public activities that might be critical of the government. Um, and that I think is totally inappropriate myself. Uh, I think that in order, one of the roles that the university should play is as a site in which we can have discussions of difficult ideas, of unpopular ideas, and do so in a civil, respectful way. It's not always easy to do that sort of thing, but if the university is not the place to do it, no place is going to do it. The university is the best situated place to have these sorts of difficult conversations. And let's face it, no matter what society you're in, those who govern society will be imperfect, just like the rest of us. Some of them are better than others, but in some cases, so societies are run, whether it's, whether it's whole societies or whether it's just the local government, but they're, they're governed by people who do not have a genuine care about social well-being, or they've got views about what amount, what constitutes social well-being that deserve to be criticized. They just don't, they can't, they don't hold up to criticism. And it's not the, it's not the primary, I think, as, as a professor or an instructor, your primary role is not to be a social critic. Your primary role is to be an educator. And my own view is that the best way to educate is to inform and to give tools of critical assessment. And then, but not to preach, not to try to convert students to think the same, same con have the same content as your own thinking does but rather to give them the tools to make up their own minds critically. So that if, if in the end of the day, some people decide to I, um, uh, endorse views that are politically opposed to yours, oh well, you know, that, you know, that's just something you've got to accept. Um, that said, you should also be free to to consider the merits of arguments offered on behalf of existing social programs, whether they're coming from one side of the political spectrum or the other side of the political spectrum. And any infringement on that on the part of the government seems to me to be an illicit, illegitimate infringement on, uh, on an academic's right. Now, the specific question you asked, and then I'll stop and let you ask something else. The specific question you asked was about, say, social media posts. 
So I think there's an important difference between what an instructor does in, the, in her capacity as an instructor in the classroom, say, versus what an instructor does in her capacity as a private citizen, say, on social media, where she's not a, she's not representing her university in an official capacity, even though she's an employee of the university, she's speaking as a private citizen. In that case, she should be allowed to say what anybody should say, which is more, almost everything, not everything, there are limits to free speech, I think, but almost everything without being sanctioned for it. So there should, there should not be that sort of ethics test to make sure that people who are instructors at universities or state employees generally uh, are effectively censored in what they say in their private capacity. I don't, I don't think those sorts of restrictions are legitimate. Yes, okay, thank you very much for your answer. And uh, I think I give the floor to Alex Pleshko. Well, uh, since uh, uh, the last question you answered with the previous one, I, I just want to, you know, uh, to, to ask, uh, well, it is understandable when we are outside university, we are like private citizens, but uh, I mean, for example, uh, something like Facebook or, you know, or Twitter, so it is not so easily, you know, to understand whether it is, uh, whether you are speaking as a, a part of university or as a private citizen. And for example, journalists are often, um, they, they, they can uh, take your words from your social media and just to, you know, to write that, for example, you are professor of this university. And in this case, you know, this framing will, will show that somehow you are speaking on behalf of university or something like that. So what to do with this? this you know the uh, the very question: Where is the line of private citizen and university member? Is it possible to yeah. know? I I think that uh, Alex, the the <laughs> area you described is one in which a journalist is manipulating the information that's being distributed to readers, and that's immoral. Uh, if, if your question is, well, how can we prevent that? I don't know the answer to that question. But if the question instead is, is there a principled distinction to draw of the sort that I was relying on between your activities in an official capacity and your activities as a private citizen? I think that the answer is yes. There is a principled distinction that you can draw. When you're speaking to your students, for instance, and making assignments to them about what to read, when you are lecturing in a classroom about the content of the material that you're discussing, when you talk to students in your office hours uh, or on, you know, on Zoom or not about the class material, you are operating in an official capacity. If you are on Twitter or Facebook posting things, you are not. You are not speaking in that case as you are not saying, this is the view of my institution. No, you're speaking in your own voice. You're saying, this is, this is the view of Alex Pleshkov, one citizen among many citizens. It's true, I happen to be a professor, but I am not speaking in my capacity as a professor. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm posting here on social media reflects the whole of my life experience, which includes a university education. So I'm speaking in a sense as a philosopher, but that's not, that's different from saying I'm speaking as in, in, with the voice of and with the backing of and in the name of my institution. That's, that's not what you're doing unless you're an official university spokesperson. Right? But if you're not, then you're speaking as a private citizen and your speech should be regulated just as any other private citizens should be regulated. And in my view, that regulation should be very minimal. Not non-existent, but minimal. We should be more or less allowed to say what we want um, with more or less, with certain exceptions. 
Um, thank you. So I, I, I mean, I heard a lot of things. Uh, it would be so cool to discuss in more detail. Maybe, uh, you know, in a half a year, we will have a second round if you don't mind. But uh, um, thank you very much for your answers. And I think that it was really inspiring. I, I, I completely agree with Nadezhda. And it is great to hear how you see all these uh, difficult issues. Um, and uh, now, if you don't mind, we will have this quick round of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, short an answers. Um, so the first one, um, I realized that it was not good frame uh, in, in the file I sent you, but I hope you don't mind if I, I will frame it a little bit different. Sure. So sure. The first one, um, yeah, who, who would you call the classical philosopher par excellence? Do you have the one uh, or maybe two, three? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd say that in terms of moral philosophy, uh, I can't. I can't just. I can't list just one. I would. I would say. I would list three: Aristotle, Kant, and Hume. Uh, those are the. Those are the three. And 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 where is consequentialist? Where 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 is uh, where? They're not. The, yeah. Okay. If I had a fourth, I'd throw Mill in there. But okay. I I think that you know uh, I think that Henry Sidgwick's Methods of Ethics is a deeper book than Mill's Utilitarianism. So if we were talking just about uh, the depth of understanding that reading a given book might be able to provide you, I would put Sidgwick on, on that list. So, I mean, there, there are a lot, there are different dimensions. What your question just brought to mind is that there's actually different dimensions of being a classic. Uh, I, I was thinking mostly in terms of influence on both students and fellow philosophers. And I think Though I think Mill has had much more influence on students, certainly, and he's been the subject of much more critical study, interestingly, than Sidgwick. But if you think instead of a classic as, as a work that um, can afford you, can reward repeated, repeated, repeated readings, and it goes very, very deep, then I'd say Sidgwick is, is the place to go rather than Mill. Okay, uh, thank you. And the second question is, uh, and who is your favorite philosopher? I have, can I list two? One living, one dead. Sure, sure. <laughs> I keep, I keep stretching things. Uh, <laughs> but my favorite living philosopher is one is one of my former teachers, Martha Nussbaum. She, uh, she had, she's brilliant along many different dimensions. And uh, it's just, it's not for me at least. It's usually very hard to read philosophy, and I if I had a choice between spending an hour reading philosophy and spending an hour reading a novel, I'd read the novel because it's much more enjoyable, and I like short term pleasures. But uh, in Martha's case, she's not only got an incredibly wide-ranging mind, incredibly novel ideas, but she's also a beautiful writer. It's a real pleasure to read her work. And she talks about incredibly important issues, both perennial, big life issues, but also issues of, of great contemporary importance, like the oppression of women. In, um, in countries around the world, uh, religious freedom, how to, how to balance universal values with sensitivity to cultural nuances. It's, it's, an, incre it's, it's an incredible mind. Uh, so, and it's just always a pleasure to engage with what she, what she writes. Uh, as far as someone who's no longer alive, my favorite philosopher actually is W.D. Ross, Sir David Ross. He's not someone who's 
nearly as well known as the big figures I, I mentioned before, but his is the view that I think is the most insightful uh, view in moral philosophy. It's, uh, it's the one that is likeliest, some version of which is likeliest to be true, I think. And that was a little bit unexpected. So, but uh, as Heraclitus said, if you don't do not expect the unexpected, you will not find it. Because during the, <laughs> our conversation, I think I, I I heard twice not you but Socrates with you know the unexamined life is worth living. I I I was for Socrates as the second one, but thank you. And, He's up there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the third question is um, what. Uh, would you call the most important philosophical issue or issues for the next 10 years, uh, you know, for the next uh, generation? Uh, that's just, that's so hard. Uh, the, uh, I'm not, sh I'm not sure. I'm going to try to make things a little easier on myself by saying this. There are, there have been a, a huge number of perennial philosophical issues, including the ones that I devote my research to, which is in metaethics. How do you, how do you gain moral knowledge? What is the nature of moral reality? These are questions that are, that have been important since we started thinking philosophically. I think they'll continue to be important. So rather than try to nominate one of those issues, it's already received its, you know, its attention. And if I'm still alive, it will continue to receive attention. Um, I'd let, let me think about something that's relatively new and, uh, or a new set of questions, relatively new set of questions. And for me, those questions have to do with um, the ethics of oppression. So it's, it's not a completely new idea that um, attending to the voices and interests of those who have been left behind in the society can bring greater insights into the human condition. That's not a brand new idea, but there has been such a resurgence in, uh, in thinking about questions of structural injustice that uh, I'm very excited to see what that sort of work over the next decade or next generation brings. I think it's gonna be very, very rich and questions to do with how to make society and the world at large a fairer, more egalitarian, more just place in which to live. It's not only of paramount practical importance, but I, I think, well, I think because it is that, and because a, a lot of philosophers are feeling free to pursue those issues, I think we're gonna see some really great work being done over the course of the next generation around that constellation of issues. Thank you. And the last one is more practical one. Um, are there online resources from universities, encyclopedias to YouTube channels that you would advise to follow for those interested in philosophy and in ethics in particular? Yeah, so here, here it is. We've had a lovely hour and a quarter together. I have at least. And then I'm going to end on a completely flat, bad note because I, I don't know the answer to your question. So I'm not, I don't spend, I spend a lot of time on Zoom <laughs> and I do my research uh, by writing on a computer, but I don't, I've, I have almost never looked at YouTube, for instance. I'm not on Facebook or I'm not on social media. I'm the worst person to ask this question of because I just don't, I just don't do any of that stuff um, online. So I'm very sorry. If, if you can find anyone else to ask, you should ask them this question. If you can't, 
then shoot me an email and I'll start, I'll talk to my grad students and ask my colleagues and they are much more savvy about this and I can get you some answers that way. Oh, no, thank you. I mean, it was a perfect, so we didn't need, uh, you know, more information because uh, some, of us, uh, some of us are not in social media, for example, and uh, sometimes you feel ashamed because of it, but now it is cool that we hear that it is okay not to. <laughs> No, I mean, may, maybe I should feel ashamed too. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, but we will figure out in future. But I mean, it is it is perfectly you know uh, uh, per perfect uh, answer because it will help some of us at least. And thank okay. you so much. It was a great pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for your time and for your you know kind attitude. Uh, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. thank you very much for the invitation. It was uh, thank you for the difficult, provocative questions, um, and I enjoyed talking with you as well.